Would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I don't see any members of the public here, so we will jump right to the consent agenda. Could we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the consent Second. Any discussion on any of the items on the consent agenda? Anything you'd like to pull out? Seeing none, all those in favor? Unanimous, thank you very much. <clears throat> Chairperson's remarks in business. I have a, um, I had three things. Dina was going to present um, a report on the regional schools committee, but she is not feeling well, so she's not here tonight. Um, the other two things, actually three things, we do need to appoint an official alternate delegate to the MASC annual business meeting, which is on uh, the Friday of the conference. Wednesday of the conference. I know it's not a... Oh, did they switch it to Wednesday? Back to Wednesday? I'm sorry. Okay. I, I was just going to volunteer to do it because I know it's not a popular thing, but I'd be willing to stay back to attend if well, no one else wants to. I'm, I apologize. I haven't looked at the agenda, um, at the book that closely. Mary's saying it's Wednesday. I, I'm actually planning to go down early. <clears throat> so would that be a help to you? <laughs> I'd be, then I'd be happy to do it, if everybody else is okay with that. Well, I would, um, could we have a nomination to make Robin the alternate delegate to the MSC annual business meeting? I will nominate Robin. Second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you very much. I think that's great that they moved it back to Wednesday again. That I think should help attendance, actually. Excellent. Um, one thing I wanted to, the, the next two items actually are connected kind, kind of sort of to the um, stadium. One thing I just kind of want to remind everybody of, there were a lot of emails back and forth um, regarding the stadium and <clears throat> some questions last week and um, before our meeting, right before our meeting, the phone calls and a lot of emails and things like that. I just want to remind everybody that um, please before you respond by phone call or email, please let me know that you were contacted, that you would like to contact these people because all um, communication of that should at least go through me or Christopher um, before you do that, before you call or respond or anything. I'm not talking about if somebody calls you, but before you reach out to somebody else, would you please make sure that you at least let me know or um, Christopher questions about that okay the other um, thing regarding the stadium is um, I there was a meeting as you saw uh, of a stadium committee um, Brian and Christopher were there Chris Walsh uh, people from Gale Associates and um, I have a suggestion that um, a member of the school committee attend those meetings not necessarily to contribute points on architecture or paint color or anything like that, but just to attend those meetings. Dina has expressed interest in attending the meetings, and what I'd like to know is if um, anybody else is interested in attending those meetings. There is no formal meeting schedule set. The meetings are going to be called as needed, so when and where, where they would be, obviously here, when they would be would be different. But um, you can think about that, and if it's something that you'd like to um, attend, you think if you can, then just let me know. Either tell me or um, email me or something if you'd like to do that. All right, we have a student representative's report. Shannon. Hi, everyone. I'd like to start out by commenting on the fact that it's already almost mid-October. I'm still in shock over how, qu how quickly the first quarter has gone by. The leaves have rapidly begun to change, the weather is getting colder, and fall sports teams are passionately pursuing their goals of making the tournament as the end of the season nears. There's no doubt that this is a busy time of year. With the eventful weeks ahead, there is some, some exciting news circulating at Triton. For starters, 
Neighbors Administration has recently announced a district-wide Wi-Fi installation to provide all students and easy access to safe and high-speed internet. I believe I mentioned at the last committee meeting that the English department has received a new set of Chromebooks. With this new luxury of internet access, students will be able to conduct research, find outside sources, use their email, and much more, all without having to leave the classroom. On another note, there has been a major update regarding the stadium project. During a recent meeting on September 24th, it was confirmed that the construction process should begin by June of next year. Design and cost estimates will be decided upon on November 14th. The Triton community anticipates an increased sense of school spirit once these changes are made. Um, another thing this week, invitations to apply to the National Honor Society were sent out. Baseline criteria for membership includes achieving a GPA of 3.95 or higher as of September 2014. Yesterday evening from 6.30 to 8.30 in the high school library, Triton held a new workshop specializing in the basic rights of special education. This was organized to help parents of special needs students gain a better understanding of how they can work with their child's school to ensure the best education possible. Yesterday was also the first college fair day. Students will be able to learn about a variety of schools every Tuesday of October from 7.30 to 9 a.m. in the high school library. Yesterday, we had 28 colleges represented. Tomorrow night from 5 to 8 p.m., Triton Music Parents Organization will be hosting a fundraising night at Bradley House of Pizza. Students and their families are encouraged to support Triton's performance. where they will be greeted by their Triton hosts. The, ch the exchange students will learn about the American culture through integration into the Triton community, as well as a series of exciting field trips. There will also be a welcome breakfast for our exchange students and the host students on Tuesday at 7 a.m. in the library. Um, Monday, October 13th, is Columbus Day, so all schools in the district will have the holiday off. Oh, <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to keep my distance. Wednesday, October 15th, <laughs> all juniors will be taking the PSAT exam. And this is a test in which will help students to prepare for the SAT. They will receive good feedback about verbal math and writing skills, receive college information, and international competition for scholarships. On Thursday, October 16th, Triton will be hosting a college planning night for all sophomore students. And on Saturday, October 25th, the PTA will be hosting the annual fundraiser, Triton is Haunted. This will take place in both the middle and high school and will begin at 5 p.m. Students and student groups are encouraged to help set up a spooky or fantasy setting for the evening's events. The middle school lobby has decided to decorate with the Frozen theme. On Monday, November 3rd, the second quarter will begin and report cards will be issued on Wednesday, November 12th. On Wednesday, November 5th, students who were absent during the English language MCAS testing will have an opportunity to make up the exam. This will continue through Thursday. At 1 p.m. that day, Matt Clark, a speaker from the Students Against Destructive Decisions organization, will be talking to kids about making safe choices during an assembly in the auditorium. That's all for the agenda for the next month. If anyone has any questions regarding upcoming events or recent news, I'd be happy to answer them. Shannon, thank you for a great presentation and update. I do have a question about um, the student population and their awareness of the stadium project. I mean, the administration has sent out recent emails to parents. How aware are the kids of how close this might be? Are they excited? Are they really aware of it? To be honest, I think um, students aren't that aware because I think they've just seen it as a far off thing. but. Since this has been announced that it's really going to may be a thing next fall, I think students are getting really excited, especially the junior class who will be able to use it possibly in next season. Yeah, I just I would ask you to take that back with you from tonight's yeah. meeting to maybe brainstorm about ways the um, school community could become more aware and kind of gear up and get excited yeah. about it and share that with their parents. <laughs> Yeah, because I think once everybody finds out, that's going to be exciting news. I don't think everyone knows quite yet. 
but that's definitely going to be a thing that's going to generate excitement. Thanks. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry for the microphone malfunction. I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's your job. Okay. Have a good night. Thank you. So one of the benefits of Wi- or one of the downsides of Wi-Fi is it's another signal. <laughs> so now that we have wireless in here, it's, as you can hear, kind of wreaking havoc with the wireless microphone system. Oh, so I didn't know that's, that's what that was. that's what Bob is feverishly trying to figure out. Oh, thank you for that technical information interlude yes that's good all right moving along to reports and deliberations first on the list is the mcas results from spring 2014. Uh, thank you this is the bill belichick report it, it is what it is um typically in the past we, we've had principals come to this meeting and they've been the first second third fourth and fifth spear holders for the left and and really n not had any opportunity to contribute because the schools have not yet had the opportunity to do the analysis that they they need to do um, so after consultation with the chairperson I, I stood them down uh, the, the, this evening um, a, as usual for the um, the MCAS results you have a cohort uh, by cohort analysis at Annex 7 um, which also indicates whether the percentage of advanced or proficient has gone up or, or, or down. Um, I, I remind you that year-to-year -year data does not provide trends. In, in my view, you need at least three years of data uh, to establish a trend. The, the state results are, are described as very flat, and, and our results are, are very flat as, as, as well. Um, in terms of student growth percentiles, that there's some disappointment in that uh, you, you have a separate um, um, no at, at the bottom of this report that there is a report on student growth percentiles and they have dropped a little from last year um, you'll, you'll see that for all students English language arts it's 52.3 I'm on the second page now page 27 and math is 53.9 uh, they were 55 and 56 last year. Uh, 50 is inevitably the way this is calculated is the, the, state, the state average. We set ourselves a district development, development plan target of, of 55. Um, however, it has, I remind you that, that uh, when the state published um, uh, median st student growth percentiles for the first time, uh, they indicated what they would consider to be a year's growth what was average was 40 to 60 and we set ourselves a target of 55 uh, can the, the 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 top the top quartile of of that range i also need to remind you that when they published these first time round they said there was a 10 percent error factor um in 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 the data so it, it's fairly it, it's not very precise uh, data um, you remember that the student growth percentiles take students who were in a similar position in terms of MCAS performance of the year before and it compares them now so it's a comparative piece of data it, it's not benchmarked as such because if our students do reasonably well and some other comparable students do very very well then our students don't do as as well, and obviously there's a whole range of factors uh, that that um, affect how our particular cohort um, is, is 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 making progress. Um, I, I I don't think that circumstances <coughs> provide a, an excuse for the performance of our students in terms of low-income English language learners, students with special needs, they don't provide an excuse, but in some senses they do provide a context for our, for our work. We have 68 uh, students at the moment who are homeless. Um, I think it was week before last I was talking to the, the middle school principal who said he had a, a student who came to school that morning who did not know where they were going home that evening. Can you imagine that in, in terms of, of, of concentrating 
on, on, on work. So, th so those are challenges. That, that they're not excuses, but, but there is no doubt that the proportion of students who come to school with challenges like that, um, or in particular at the moment, have behavioral issues, which seems to be a statewide uh, trend, uh, whether you talk to, I, I talk to superintendents in other districts or to our special education consortium, the message is there are more and more children who are coming to school with serious behavioral issues. <coughs> and, and, and obviously that, that pre presents a, a challenge. So th these, these results, um, in summary, are, are, are relatively flat. Um, I don't think there are reason for us to be depressed because <clears throat> I'll explain in a moment to do some of the things uh, that, that we're trying to do to, to deal with it. I, I've put a supplementary paper around the, 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 the table today um, that includes at the top of the page that's got some blue on it, uh, the student growth percentiles over the past uh, few, few years, 2010 to 2014. Um, and you can see that apart from last year, where we had a, a, a very encouraging blip up, um, that they're, 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 they're fairly static. Um, below, you'll recall that there are five accountability levels. One is the top. Five means the state has probably taken you over. And for the past two years, um, the district and all our schools um, have been steady. Um, in the blue box, there's an explanation there of what the progress and performance index target means. We needed to hit uh, 75. And apart from the high school for all students, and don't forget, they're only, te they're only assessing genuine sophomores. That, that means there are some children in that, who were in that cohort in the middle school and ninth grade are not then assessed um, in, in, in the sophomore year. Over the page, I seem to have lost a page here. Um, I want to go back to page 28, if I may. Um, th th this, this provides some comparative data with the uh, state and in blue is our four-year average, and in red is the state. And you'll see that uh, in both English language arts and to a lesser extent, um, in math and to a lesser extent in ELA, uh, we start reasonably high in third grade, go down in fourth grade, go up through five and six, go down seven and eight, and then back up uh, in 10. That, that is a typical profile. If you go to Newton, Wellesley, anywhere you like, you will find that that is the profile. Um, at the state level, because children change schools at grades five, seven, um, and, and uh, five, six, and seven into middle school, middle schools have got a variety of changes, those transitions impact students' development. Because of the size of the sample in the state data, it tends to even those out in, 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 in math. So o overall, our profile is very similar uh, to, to that of the state. And what I find constantly puzzling is that the question is, does this data reflect our students and our teachers, or does it affect the tests that they're taking? Because while I could well understand that um, students' performance should gradually increase over time as schooling compensates for the fact that many children arrive in school pretty, rather ill-prepared. And you would expect that school to kind of compensate for that over time, particularly when we've got, say, Title I uh, uh, services. It doesn't really explain how, since I arrived in the Commonwealth in 2003, this profile has looked like this. And, and so, I, 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 I think we, as Mr. Belichick would say, it is what it is. Um, the, the, this profile is not dissimilar from the profile you would find in, in other states. And intriguingly, in all the discussion around MCAS and Park, 
the, the, the way that this profile develops through the great majority of districts appears not to be part of the conversation. It would suggest to me that our expectations of fourth graders and fifth graders and sixth graders and seventh graders are unrealistic because otherwise you have a fairly flat or gently increasing profile um, through grade three through, through ten. That, that is not something that gets uh, a, a lot, of, lot of discussion. Um, back to uh, the, 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 the other paper, we've established that we're at uh, level two last year and this year. Turn the page over, and you may have read about this in the, in the Globe recently. It shows the, the numbers of schools and districts who are in level one, which is the top level. And you'll, if, if you look at districts in 2012, there were 96, 2013, 91, 2014, 73. And if you look at the schools, 2010, level one, 510, 2013, 505, 2014, 424. That, that partly ref, reflects the fact that the, the state arrangement for determining progress in what they call narrowing the achievement gap is adjusted every two years. It's cranked up every two years, irrespective of the progress in the previous uh, two, two, two years. Um, th th this, this data has been predicted uh, for a, g a good while since the state introduced uh, this system. And, and what you have are really good schools who are being labeled as less than really good schools and their teachers and arguably the community um, because of the assessment system <coughs> and evaluation system that has been, 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 been put in place. So this is the context in which we are working, okay? H having said that, there's a, a, a further paper um, at page 29 um, where the Chief Academic Officer ha reminds us of what we are doing in terms of um, initiatives intended to um, increase teacher effectiveness and improve um, student uh, achievement. You've seen this before. This is simply an update uh, of, of that. Um, it's not complete because we keep looking at these issues all the time. On, on Friday of this week, uh, Shannon Nolan, the assistant principal at Salisbury, will be working with all the um, special education uh, teachers uh, to help them better think about how they establish, first of all, IEP goals which are related to state academic standards, and secondly, to make sure that we are starting, we, we are establishing smart goals uh, that will enable us to do some strong progress, progress monitoring. That's not on here, but, but, but it, it, it is something that, uh, that, 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 that we are doing um, at, at the present time. Um, the other thing that we are doing, we've been talking about the fact that as we've responded to teachers' wish for professional development that is much more aligned with their, their particular needs, that's meant that our professional development system is much more differentiated. That means that administrators can't be in all of it. And one of the things we've been having recently, uh, discussing recently, is how do administrators who, who haven't participated in the professional development um, ensure that that um, practice is being embedded in the in the day-to-day -day work of, of, of teachers? And at the last meeting, of the teaching and learning leadership team that includes all our supervisors. We had some discussion about strategies for, for, for doing that. Uh, another thing we're doing is earmarking particular pieces of professional development um, which will, um, with which all administrators will have an, an experience. Um, at the last meeting of the leadership team, we were joined um, by the, the, the lady who developed um, Keys to Literacy. And as a result of that, all the administrators are going to have a professional development exercise around Keys to, to uh, Literacy. The, 
uh, professional development for special education teachers, which I mentioned a moment ago, is going to be replicated at the teaching and learning leadership team next week when Shannon Nolan will take all the supervisors through the work that, that she is going to do, be doing on Friday with, um, um, with, with the uh, special, educa special education teachers. Um, the chief academic officer and I um, talk regularly um, and uh, there are times when she's impatient and I say to her, you, we're not going to turn this around overnight. And then I will go into her office and say, look at this data, we're not getting traction on what we're doing. And she tells me there's lots and lots of good things going on. It takes time for these things to embed themselves um, uh, to, to, to uh, have, have an impact on, on all children. So the, the overall picture is in terms of MCAS scores and student growth percentiles is pretty flat. Um, there are some um, hot spots. Um, when I intend that we will report to you further at the next meeting when we'll look at schools individually. I know, for example, that Newbury is, is uh, very excited about the progress that they have made with, with, the, um, with the growth of high-need students over, over the past uh, year as a result of particular things that they have been doing uh, to focus on, on those, those, the, those students. So th that's the Bill Belichick report. Uh, hopefully we'll have some more analysis um, at your November meeting. If members of the committee have questions or if Kim wants to chime in, uh, then th let's do that. <coughs> Monique has a question. Christopher, um, I just want to ask your opinion. On the 10th grade um, achievement levels, uh, would you say the 10th graders do better because it's a high stakes test for them? I, I don't That's think so. That's why it's a trend for across a, a lot the of, A lot of people will look at the 8th grade test and the 10th grade test and say the 10th grade is easier. So I mean that they have to pass it to graduate, they have to do well to graduate. It, I, I, that, that, may be, that may be part of it, but don't forget the 10th grade test is only taken by genuine sophomores. Right. So that 9th graders who haven't actually graduated into 10th grade are not part of that cohort. And that's one reason why high schools across the state uh, do appear to do much better than, say, eight, eighth grade, because they're not comparable cohorts. But yes, it does become more high stakes test, and they, they have to pass it in order to graduate. I, I think um, you get to take it at least five times, right? So does that but they can have a, that? They, they can have a number of goes at it, yes. Yeah. And the test gets easier each time, is that true? Uh, I don't think it gets easier each time, <laughs> but people do, do say uh, that, that the tenth grade assessments, uh, MCAS tests are, are not as difficult as eighth grade. On the, um, the levels that you showed for all these districts, um, at some point, you can see that the numbers are going down for the level one districts, at some point, a lot of schools are only going to get to the level that they can get to. So that number is going to get, get smaller and smaller and smaller. You're not going to have level one probably 10 years from now. So what's going to happen? Everybody's going to be level two, level three? Well, we, we won't know because the part test or some other oh, we'll uh, version of the MCAS test will, will replace it and we will start to completely develop new benchmarks uh, for, the, for this data. Does anyone else have a question? Suzanne? Um, along that line, um, has there been any, any pushback from any districts, uh, I know not this district, but um, addressing the fact that, that the state gives us these tests, they're statistically, you can't reach the goal. Everyone knew that you couldn't do that. And now they're coming out with a new one. And um, my concern is, is that they say, here's this test, take this test, everyone reaches that test, and they said, oops, well, everyone can't get an A. And so they give you another test. Is there any pushback from anyone in the state that says that these tests um, are essentially going a different direction from the way that we want to be teaching? We want to be teaching differentiated learning. We want to teach individual. And we have a students take a test one day, or multiple days, whatever day it is, a high stakes one day test. They could be sick. They could be not feeling well and they're assessing districts on this one test. And I just don't know if the, the if as a superintendent, um, the development of these tests by the state, I think is poor, and I don't think is well developed. And I think that they're always just kind of 
filling in the gaps as we go. And I just didn't know if, if, the, if you heard anything about that or... I, I think one of the issues is that developing assessments is, is a highly sophisticated um, activity uh, that the great majority of superintendents are not trained in. So, so we, we, ha we have to look at them as not exactly lay people, uh, but on the basis of, of our knowledge and, and, and experience. Um, looking at the park, I, I think that most people would say that the fact that it um, places within English language arts a much greater emphasis on understanding complex text, and particularly non-fiction texts, is a better preparation for the real world than much of the kind of literature-based um, English language arts that, that most of us grew up, grew, grew up with. Um, that th there's a fear that the, the math assessments have gone too far too fast. Um, it, I was with somebody the other day, a superintendent the other day, who was saying that they tried to do one of the park model um, uh, tests and they got it wrong. And they got it wrong not because they um, didn't get the right answer, but because they hadn't used the, the best way to get to that answer. Um, so there's there's... Uh, all, all that. Um, I, I think we all have to rely on experts at, at some at some point. Um, at, at this stage, I think it's a question of of, of, of wait and see. Uh, the majority of the pushback on the park has been politi politically based. I think rather than e e e educationally based. Um, and I, I'm certainly happy to kind of see, see how this goes. But the one thing that I will say is that you talked about a, a one-day test. Uh, the one thing that's different about the park is it does have a performance-based assessment um, in, in March. And, and, and then it has a, a, a kind of more, more traditional uh, uh, summative assessment in June. So th there are at least two forms of assessment as, as part of that. <coughs> And the performance-based assessment means that it's much less of a standardized test than, than MCAS. So to that extent, it, it is more ambitious um, and arguably likely to be more authentic uh, than the MCAS as, as currently constituted. I don't know, Kim, do you, do you want to ch ch no, ch I think um, you explained that quite well. And, and I do believe quite that. Quite well. That's quite well. Quite well. <laughs> <laughs> Exemplary. Um, and I think the teachers are, are anxious about the park in so that um, they have been doing some great things in the classroom and all you have to do at any day is do a walkthrough. And I think on the day when the MCAS results were released, I do get discouraged because I know how hard the kids are working, I know how hard the teachers are working, and I know how hard we are working. And so when it comes down to this high stake test, um, you kind of have to look at it, then take a step back, but go, and in, go into the classrooms and see the high level of engagement that's occurring, to see the collaboration with the teachers, to see um, teachers looking over data to try to problem solve when, when kids don't have a profile that is really clear cut. So, that, so it, there's some great stuff. And unfortunately, that doesn't come out in a percentage all the time, and you want it to. Um, so I think with the new challenges as far as the park goes, will it be better than the MCAS? We don't know. What we do is we teach to the state standards <coughs> and we differentiate our curriculum and we look at data. And so we can only ask the teachers that that is exactly what they do each day and that this, we need to take this, but we need to piece it together with some of the other data, ha data that we have, whether it be through walkthroughs, through our collection of grade, through our collection of DRAs and all these other uh, assessments that we'll talk about in a little bit to help us really have a good profile and feel confident and good about what we're doing within this school district because it is far above, I think, what these numbers represent. And that is not to say um, that we don't have areas to improve upon because, as Christopher said, I, for one, am anxious to get to work every single day because I want to do one specific thing to move that needle to get those kids who are kind of on the, the edge um, beyond that edge. And how I can directly or indirectly do that, I will find a way. 
So um, I think we're ready for the next challenge, and I think we need to take this in stride, but also celebrate some of the good things that are going on, because even as an educator in this district, for as many years that I have been in, I have never seen it to the degree that it is at this particular point in time. So. Just, just to illustrate, um, I, I spent part of last Friday afternoon in Pine Grove School um, where, where the teachers were working in grade levels um, looking at their MCAS uh, results and, and, and uh, trying to identify where their students had not done well. Um, and in two of the discussions that I joined, we, we got into a discussion about the fact that the teachers believed that the students understood and knew the work but the particular way that the question had been they were looking at the individual questions the particular way that a question had been put was unfamiliar to them and and the fact that the the kind of format of the question was was unfamiliar um, probably meant that the, 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 the children performed much less well than their teachers might have expected. Now that led to a discussion about, well, during our normal teaching, should we try to make sure that uh, when we give student assignments, we give them a sufficiently rich mix of types of assignments to prepare them for all eventualities in the MCAS. I don't know whether we can do that, but that, that's the kind of level of discussion that's going on. Uh, in schools in, in, in response to, to the results? I don't think that my, my question was whether or not you're doing a good job. I, that You weren't answering my question. My question was whether or not you think the MCAS is a good test and the park is a good test. That and I, I just don't see what you're saying to me is it's not. Well, we know that we know that the MCAS has limitations because it's because it's not really been adjusted for the new state frameworks in English language arts and mathematics right. so, so that was adopted in 2010. The park is intended okay, to, so, to be right, aligned. Okay, so the park is intended, um, uh, and I, I, I know that you're aware that the the teacher evaluations, how a teacher is evaluated, is now how their students perform on that test. Is that correct? That's correct, and I keep reminding our teachers uh, that, that if you look at the data in front of you here, uh, in terms of um, our um, average student growth percentiles, they're all over 50. Well, well 40, 40 to 60 is moderate growth, and that is supposed to be the equivalent of a year's growth. That is okay. Now, we, we, clearly there are some parts of the system where we're not doing that well, but typically our teachers uh, have got our students performing at a year's growth. No, no, I'm not questioning the effectiveness. I think our teachers are doing a great job. I, I, have, I have no, I'm not harping on the district or the teachers. What I'm saying is, is that we have a system in place that evaluates our teachers and evaluates our students that I'm not sure that we are confident with. We, we're, not con we, we're not really confident with it. We're not really, uh, we don't even know what the park test really is going to be about but like, we're putting all this emphasis on it. And where is the pushback from the superintendents of the state to say that I don't think that the state is actually giving any benefit to, to our districts? That's what I was asking. Is there any pushback from the superintendents or the districts that you have heard of that say, I think there might be something, I'm not confident in this test, I don't agree with all the measures that have been taking place over all these years. Statistically, we've known this thing didn't work years ago. And not once have I heard a district say, to hell with the MCAS, this is, not, is poorly designed, it doesn't do it, does do it justice, and there's gaps in here. And that's what I get frustrated with is we, we build all this stuff around MCAS, and everyone knows that there was a problem with it. And now we have this park system coming into place that we, really quite, we don't really quite know what's going on with it, but yet now we're putting students and we're putting teachers in this, this box that our students have to perform and we're getting evaluated on, or the teachers are getting well, evaluated Well, superintendents are pushing back collectively through the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents in the context of the fact that these tests are mandated. But that's what I'm asking. What, what is the pushback? That was my question. It's not whether or not how well... How the, the, the pushback at the moment is, is essentially damage uh, lim limitation and particularly around uh, district-determined measures, which is the bit that impacts teachers. Um, I, I think that superintendents are trying to defuse that situation as, as much as we can. Um, uh, Chief Academic Officer and I met with the Teachers Association on Monday. 
to uh, look at a whole range of issues around, around DDMs. The critical thing about DDMs is that the, the impact of the teacher can only be assessed after there's been a discussion between the supervisor and the teacher, which has to take into account the, 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 co the, the composition and diversity of the class and, and, and their, their previous level of, of, of achievement. As, as this paper indicates, on average, our teachers are doing fine right. in, in relation to that, and so I'm trying to encourage them uh, not, not to start hyperventilating um, ab about it, <coughs> Uh, that, that it will be the basis of discussion, that, that um, we, we are re, we've re-engaged on, for example, questions like how long should a student be in a class before their uh, scores are counted? How many absences, you know, should they be enrolled 1st of October? Uh, if it's a semester class, do they have to be enrolled within the first two weeks? A quarter class have to be enrolled in the first week in order to experience the teaching? What level of absence? is acceptable and some of that is getting into some very difficult uh, territory around whether a student missing a class because they are receiving special education services is that an absence from the class it's not in my book but it is in some people's books is a field visit an absent absence from from a class I mean, t teachers are, are, are uh, very much on, on the edge ar around these things and, and we're trying to find a way that, that is workable and will help people understand that they will be judged fairly on the basis of decent, decent uh, data. We still have uh, teachers who are uh, working on their district measures. Uh, Kim is going to be spending um, Friday uh, in the first part, the session that I mentioned earlier that's been led by Shannon Nolan on setting IEP goals because I, I, I have, I'm not sure I persuaded, but I got the DES to agree that monitoring IEP goals is a legitimate DDM. That, that, that if we establish a goal that's going to be supported by a teacher, we progress monitor it during the year and that should be good enough. The, the early DES advice was IEP um, goals were, were, were not uh, appropriate. So we're, we're working hard to work within what's a statutory framework and it's not the kind of framework where I can do my Nelson bit. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah. Um, so as a parent and a school committee member, for years I've asked myself when these results come back, what does this test tell me about my child? Was it to tell me about their teaching, curriculum, and then ultimately about our school district and how we're progressing? And we've identified the fact that over the last few years, the um, measure of a school has changed from are we moving all our kids to 100% proficiency, which finally wise people realize that we'll, we'll just never reach 100% advanced to proficiency, so we went to that new measure of closing the achievement gap. My question to you is, under PARC, what will that measure for schools be? Is it going to be closing the achievement gap, or how will schools be rated on a level system compared to what we're seeing with MCAS? Will it be what we're currently dealing with? Will it be yet a whole new? The, 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 the state advises us that its statistician, statisticians have produced a measure of equivalence between MCAS and PARC. So that given the fact that next year some, many students will be taking MCAS, about half, another half are going to be taking about PARC, they, they have a statistical uh, technique for developing comparable results, despite the fact that Park has five levels of performance and the MCAS has, ha, has four. They're, they're also going to produce student growth, growth percentiles. Now, I've taught statistics in high school, but I don't pretend to understand the, 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 the approach that these professional statisticians are taking to do that, but, but they are saying that they, they are going to provide comparable data. Uh, the, the big issue is that we're paying so much attention to some very important parts of the curriculum uh, which tend to leave us ignoring lots of other things which are very important in, in school. 
So is it still accurate to say the goal for school districts is to, I mean, the student growth thing is one thing they've figured out. I mean, to me, that's more important than in some ways closing the achievement gap because that goes back to saying everybody goes to 100 percent. Children with special needs who are homeless who have all these disadvantages, we still want to do everything we possibly can with them, but we're still being told at the end of the day they should actually come up, everybody should be the same. Is that accurate? It's very interesting. Uh, uh, Professor Eisner used to argue that the school's job was to make increase the differences between students, not make them all the same. Uh, right. So is, will the park, as we transition and we have all these you know, overlaps with MCAS going on, but at the end of the day, we're still being evaluated as a school district and we're sitting at level two, not level one. But part of me feels like almost forget about that. Just do your very best for every kid you have and stop worrying about the labels that are put on you because I kind of disagree with their end goal of assuming that everyone will be at 100% at some point in time. But Maybe my, my, I'm totally politically my, incorrect my, my, by my, saying my, that. My impression is that notwithstanding the pressures of MCAS or PARC or whatever, teachers arrive every day to work with the kids in front of them. I, I, I really do, 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 do believe that. Uh, if that wasn't the case, we'd all be crazy. Yeah. Be because MCAS and PARC is, is assessing such a... It's very important, but it is only a part of the task that we have in developing children to be contributing members of the community, successful, skilled, empathetic, and, 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 and all those other things that we want out, out of school. But my, I guess my ultimate question and just clarification is your sense is that still, at the end of the day, when PARC is implemented, it will still be rating schools oh, yes. based yes. on closing the gap or everybody getting to some yes. goal. Can I just, I understand that PARC is very important and that we, all of us have a lot of questions on the PARC test. However, I would, would like to stay on task here as far as the MCAS test results and the progress and implementation of, implementation of initiatives and the intent of the district development plan, which is on our agenda. If the committee would like um, a presentation on the park test to the extent that the administration knows it, I think we could put that on the agenda. But right now, I would like to get us back on track and go over the MCAS um, results that we have and um, the district development plan. Paul? Ms. Farmer, I don't have so much a question, it's just an observation. If you could carry this back to the people at MASS, but this test of the MCAS has got to go out. When you have swings of 20 points on the same cohort of students from year to year, that's got to be test-based. Suzanne, that's it. I mean, there's, it there's no ifs, ands, or buts. When a test swings that much, there's no group of students and there's no group of teachers that are changing students' performance by that much, and it is test based. And the state has to do a better job with PARC. I agree. <laughs> Quickly. Bravo. <laughs> I just want to ask Christopher a question. We have comparisons of Triton with the state results. Do we have comparisons with uh, schools that have similar demographics? As I, I can provide them, yes. Um, that there's um, a part of the um, uh, DES, DESE website, which is called DART. Um, it identifies what it regards as comparable districts and provides comparable data. My only caution is that when you look at the districts that they say are comparable, they don't actually look or feel very, very comparable. Uh, but certainly, if the committee wishes for the next meeting, we can provide that data uh, for, for you. My recollection is that we do quite well. I think we're in the second, second, the uh, second from the top out of that group of eight, nine, ten districts. Ready to move along? Okay. I'm not sure who's up next. Uh, I, I'm going to start. Okay. Um, you, um, I'm embarrassed by the fact that on, on page 33, there's in red there, we have no output target. Um, 
uh, th that was put in there uh, when this was at a draft stage for other people to, to think about, um, but I'll deal with that when we, when we get to it. Uh, your last meeting, you saw this document with a whole series of comments under each of the action steps. And what we've done now is to translate those comments into the plan, um, indicating the measures of implementation, uh, who's responsible, and, and the due date for, for the, 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 uh, the work. Um, I, I, I don't think there's uh, much here that is particularly new. Um, under the second ac action step on page 31, page one of the document, uh, develop common assessments. Um, we we um, are, are going to develop a, a common format to support data analysis so that whenever a, a data team is meeting, uh, they're w working within a similar, a, a similar, similar context. Uh, differentiated instructions become fairly expanded. Um, we, we, we've agreed that the differentiation specialist will draft a, a district guide to differentiation practice, and that will that will kind of tier the kind of techniques that teachers might use so that you know somebody who's just beginning to differentiate there'll be a number of recommended recommended steps and then somebody who's more advanced some, some other things to consider and then um, uh, master beyond that we've included blending le blended learning on here uh, because blended learning is a way of differentiating because people can work anytime anywhere at their own pace uh, they can go over things a bit like a flipped classroom. If, if it's a flipped classroom where the, they've got a video for homework, they can keep stopping it, going back. Um, and it's, it is a way of, of dif differentiating. Um, the district literacy plan is as, as, as the plan. The district math plan on page three, where it says we have no output target, the, the principal output target um, for next year will be um, going through a program adoption uh, process. We've delayed this because we've been waiting for the publishers to develop materials which are in line uh, with the um, uh, re revised framework and we think that we are getting close to that so that going through a process that we have adopted, already adopted, which involves teachers obviously, um, and, and then providing professional development. Uh, school climate, we still, you'll notice from the Salisbury School Council uh, minutes that they have been looking at their uh, Talmas 2014 data. The, uh, the elementary schools will be doing that. We don't have data from, from the middle and high school because the response was too low. So we're going to introduce our, our own uh, s survey for that. And it's been suggested that, in particular, we, we survey choice in and choice out families um, and, and report the results to get um, a, a better idea of, of, of their decision-making process. Uh, Data-driven instructional decision-making, I've mentioned the common format uh, for, for doing the work. Um, homework practice, uh, we intend to resurvey families and high middle school students to see what progress we have made on that. I get less complaints, but I don't know that that's necessarily a, a, very, <laughs> a very accurate indicator of how things are, are, are going. In terms of developing, developing a professional learning community, we don't really have any performance criteria to know how we're doing, so establishing some, uh, we, we feel good about it, there are good things happening. Um, Staff meetings in a number of schools are now called professional learning community meetings. There's far more participation, far more small group work discussion in, in those meetings. Um, but we think it would be worthwhile establishing some, some clear uh, cri cri criteria. The grading process, you have a, a, a discussion paper as part of your packet um, today and uh, we will make progress on, on that. I've reached the p position of being really rather impatient about, about that, um, and I'm told I'm going to get pushed back. Um, what, what I find frustrating is that things that we are talking about have been common currency in other places 15 years ago, and, and here they're viewed as rather kind of new and radical. Uh, improving transitions, the one thing I think that we've 
two things we've identified is that we still have some issues as students with IEPs uh, transition from elementary to middle. The, the makeup of the IEP is not consistent with the way that middle school is organized and we need to find a way of presenting them uh, which leaves uh, parents confident that they're going to get the services that they, they need, even though they may be provided in a slightly different way. Um, and we're also going to be looking at support for transitions into post-secondary, post whether it's college or, or career. Uh, the educator evaluation arrangements, that, that remains under discussion. I indicated earlier that uh, Kim and I met with the TRTA on um, Monday. Uh, we have a number of issues um, to um, um, uh, agree on. I, I, I think on the whole, uh, we've agreed most of it, and we're not far away from being in a position to make some recommendations uh, to you. Um, the, um, the recommendations at this stage in the year are not time-bound, so we, we do have another month uh, to, to, put, to put them in place. Uh, graduation requirements, um, I've been in discussion with um, um, district office staff and the principal of the high school. The, you'll see from the minutes of the last council meeting of the high school that they are still, still discussing that. And one of the things that, that I know is close to the heart of one member of the school committee, financial um, literacy is, 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 is on the agenda. Um, Information technologies, um, we, we, we've got more work to do now, having got Wi-Fi as to what we think the world is going to be like in five years' time, given our kind of funding, funding con constraints. And updating facilities is all about Pine Grove and the stadium. And um, there's what we need to do with Park this year, which is described as a state mandate, not a part of the district development plan. If you have questions, we'll do our best to answer them. Questions on the district development plan? Dick? Uh, <laughs> Microphone? Oh, sorry. I just have a question regarding graduation rates, whether it be middle school to high school or uh, high school out. Um, we talked about when uh, your predecessor was here, back a year ago, March, um, about students that would have at least an F or a D and still be promoted to the next grade level and or uh, promoted uh, and graduated out of middle school. And there was conversation, a brief one, regarding s summer school. Now, I know Triton has a summer academy for kids that are enthusiastic and they're motivated to learn. But what about the children where there's hardworking teachers and they get an F, but they're still moved on? And I, I think that we're, we're taking care of the students that are highly motivated and are doing well in the classroom, but I think we're not taking care of those students that for one reason or another <coughs> just aren't getting it in the classroom. And we're pushing them, up, and we're pushing them up to the next level. And I'd just like to know if, <coughs> if you and Ms. Cattrall have discussed that issue. I, I, I will, I will, um, I will start on this because uh, if I let um, Kim loose, you'll be here for a long time. <laughs> I want you to go to my report, page forty-nine. It's part of my my discussion paper on grading. page three of the report, it's page 49. <clears throat> and at the top is a report card. And it is the report card of an individual student whose mother I met um, after the start of the school year. The only thing that's different is that the MCAS, recent MCAS scores are down the right-hand side. Uh, let's look at English. Uh, the student got a D minus in the first quarter, followed by uh, th three Fs and a final score of F. That student passed the MCAS as proficient. If you look at the comment, it's working complete, didn't make up work. So are those Fs an assessment of the student's English language arts, 
or is it because the grade level has plummeted because work wasn't handed in and they got zeros for those pieces of work? This is what the whole grading issue is, is really about. Um, if you look at some of the other areas where um, there, 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 there was a, a problem, uh, homework incomplete missing appears several times. Well, the pundits would say you do not include homework at all in, in a grade. What, what, who, who are you assessing? Dad? Mum? Elder brother? The conditions in which the child is expected to do the homework with a cacophony of uh, around them when there's, the, there isn't a quiet place to, 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 to do it. And so I, I met the mother of this child and I had to say to her, look, past, past MCAS English for the past three years, that's very important. Needs improvement is a passing score. So at this rate, this child is, is on a trajectory to, to pass the graduation requirements. And yet we, we have this report card that's littered with D, Ds and D minuses. I, I've attached to the bottom of Friday's leadership uh, team meeting. At the bottom of, of our meetings these days, I'm putting quotes that I think are important. And it's a quote from Doug Reeves that says, if you want to stop children failing, we don't need new principals, we don't need new schools, we don't need new teachers, we just need to grade fairly. And, and so that's not to say that we don't have children who move up into the high school with real problems. Uh, but, but I think um, part of the problem is that um, we, we, we have children failing for non-academic reasons and the other, and this is where Kim will pipe up, we don't have the intervention resources in the middle school and the high school to deal effectively with those difficulties when they get there. We, we've been improving them. We've now got a reading. We've got two reading specialists in the middle school now. It's shared at the high school. Uh, we've, we've got one reading specialist in the middle school and one who's now shared between the middle school and the high school to try to intervene in, in these, these circumstances. So before we get too worked up around an F, we need to work out what the F's about. Where is the child failing? Uh, when, when you look at the rep my discussion paper, you can have children with, both have a C plus, but the things that you would de do with them to improve their C plus will be very different depending on why the child got a C plus. And that, that's why our, our, our situation is very, we're, we're very alive to it. Um, we, 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 we look at the scores and uh, we're, we're supporting the, the schools, um, intervening as best they can with the resources that we, we have got. Uh, but this lady over here gets really kind of worked up about this. Kim, do you want to talk about? No, because I'll talk until 9 o'clock. No, go, 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 you, you've got five minutes. <laughs> no, I, I just think um, it, it's so true. An F represents, we have to find out what that rep that F represents. Because if we take a child who has an F because they didn't pass in their homework, I'll tell you, even if we had a summer school, that child would not be, you know, showing up for summer school. And it would be, cause more negativity towards the school and, and so on and so forth. So I think the important thing to consider is that we need to make sure how we intervene, whether it be through social and emotional support, organizational skills, or finding out why a child has shut down so much. Um, or is it because there's been some intervention that really needed to be in place that was not in place or was not implemented with true fidelity with progress monitoring? So there's really two different courses. And so again, it, it, it's about looking at different pieces of data and profiles and digging deeper to make sure that at the end of the day, you know what you are doing for that child is what that child needs and you can support it with as he said, progress monitoring data. And part of that data is looking at grades and how they progress towards standards and, and other things in addition to the MCAS score. The, the other thing to say about the summer school is that our recent discussions, discussions around blended learning has been recognizing that one way of providing that support would be a, an online program uh, du dur during the summer. Uh, we're providing it in terms of credit recovery uh, in, in, in the high school. We, we have one young lady in the high school who now is on an online program because she's not able to get, get, get to school. And so, so we see that rather than having kids come t to summer school um, because they can do that work 20, 
24-7 at home, anywhere there's a, a, a Wi-Fi connection, as long as they, they've got a, 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 com a computer, we'll find you, you. I think that's where we're going to find the, the support, and it'll be much more engaging for a student than showing up in an empty high school or somewhere else during the summer. I, I hear exactly what you're saying, um, but the way I look at it, uh, the whole body of what a teacher does in the classroom, and does involve homework, and does involve the, t the student retaining that, um, uh, that classroom work, and um, I know you've already heard it uh, from the public, the teachers teach to the test, and what does the student actually maintain in their brain regarding geography or algebra when they get out in the real world. And I think that's where homework is a good thing because it builds that foundation. It reinforces what went on in the classroom, what the teacher said. And when it comes to a quiz or a test, that student is, uh, regardless of they didn't pay attention, but if they did their homework, they may have retained something that's going to get them not an F, but maybe a C. And I just think that's important uh, that it's the full body work. We, we, we have to give them a foundation. If they don't want to do the build, put the blocks into the foundation, okay, so be it. But I think getting uh, parents more involved, realizing that, hey, if Johnny doesn't pass algebra, our summer vacation is shot. And I think we, we're all asking society to have parents get more involved. And I think this is an excellent way to get parents more involved in their child's education. Well, I just refer to the homework policy that the school committee adopted a little while ago, which makes it very clear that the homework is very important but it shouldn't be part of assessing what a child knows, understands, and is able to do. That needs to be demonstrated independently under controlled circumstances. You don't know who's done the homework. I, I agree with uh, but, but, but in terms of preparation, follow-up, practice, very important indeed, but not part of making a summative decision about what a student knows, understands, and, and can, can, can do. Does anyone else have any questions about the district development plan? Linda? Um, I have a question on the goal number three, that 90% of sophomores will read with comprehension and write effectively. Is the goal because for just targeting sophomores at, at the district level because there's literacy goals at each individual school? Well, we, we had a long discussion around that, and it relates to uh, our earlier discussion about the fact that setting that target for fourth graders is just unrealistic because the tests um, are, are not aligned with what children are really able to do at that grade level. So we've taken sophomores as the end of our education process as far as MCAS is, is, is concerned um, and uh, set, set, set that, that target. Originally that was 90% at each grade level and we recognize that's just out of reach. Don't you think uh, assessing this at sophomore level is kind of late in that child's development? We, we, we have benchmarks within the literacy development plan uh, at, at each grade level. Uh, so that, that, that plan has, has benchmarks. It doesn't mean to say that we're waiting until so the sophomore year to then decide whether we're making it or not. Um, the, the, uh, the, the literacy plan that, that Kim has put in place working with the literacy development committee uh, has benchmarks for reading and writing. Uh, at each grade level. Don't get me wrong, I know that the district has taken huge strides in bettering the literacy program. So just by hearing that Friday they're going to be having keys to literacy and it's going across the high school, the middle school, and elementary, I think will in time help with PARC when all everybody at every level is talking the same language. Right. Anyone else questions on this? Just a very quick question about what is the um, biggest pushback from teachers about the new evalu uh, reliable grading system? I, I'm not sure yet, except I got to mention a, re uh, a uh, response back from the, the uh, president of the TRTA that said this is going to be fun after we'd had some conversation about, about it. Is there a, a philosophical agreement that 
more things should be evaluated, but it is one more thing on their plate that's the pushback, or is there disagreement about measuring other things? I, I'm not sure what, what the, the disagreement is at the moment beyond we've always done it this way. And teachers will say, I take a holistic view of the whole child uh, that includes academic progress, engagement, participation, and, and so on. So that allows me to say that child is a B student. I think that's terrible language. Nobody should be called a B student. There, there, there's no question that, in my experience in this district, that many grades are an exact average of test scores. Well, well the, the, I mean, not for everybody. I'm just saying that that, that is the reality in mm -hmm. some classes. But I'm, I'm trying to excise the term average out of some of my fairly close colleagues because that's the way it's always been, been done. You take those scores and you average them. You, you don't give greater weighting to the end of a unit where children are demonstrating what they understand. I, I use the high jump. Cumulative as you've opposed heard. to culminative, yeah, you've yeah. said. Um, so we're asking people who are very capable professionals to think about doing things in, in a different way, and that's adaptive change. Uh, people people have, have developed habits, some of them over 20 years, and um, it may be surprising, so certainly I, I, was, I was looking at, uh, occasionally I go online to look for more texts ar around it. And despite the fact that all the research, and as, as Douglas Reeves would say, common sense says that a lot of what we do doesn't make sense, that's what people have done, and we're having to get them to rethink what, what they do and, and why they do it. And the biggest fear is that if we do this, a lot of children who got A's will be getting Bs because those contributing factors that got them to the A will be pulled out. You know, the young lady who's very compliant, always very helpful in class, always looking to answer questions, gets the homework in on time, um, that part of it, of the grade, will be pulled out into a, a second line of, of grades to do with uh, participation and citizenship and and, and, and so on. So we will finish up with more Bs. And that's the hard part because everybody in America is entitled to an A. Yeah, I don't think we want great inflation. I mean, I think that's not what I'm asking But, but that's for, not, but is that's, that, that is, that, that will be one of the, and then people say, well, what happens when they have a transcript and they apply to college? How do we handle that? <coughs> and that means we would need to communicate with colleges that, that we have a grading system that is more rigorous than ma many others. And I think actually colleges, I think a lot of colleges are now rethinking, Harvard certainly has been rethinking grade inflation in, in the past three, three or four years. Um, so we have a job to do, not just within district, with teachers and families, but also with um, uh, other institutions who are interested in what our children are, are, are doing. But the one thing we will be able to do is say to colleges, the, these kids are contributing citizens, uh, they're, they're, they're empathetic, uh, they're organized, um, and, and team players, and th that is what the world is looking for these days, not, not just the A student who is, has very little limit, has very little sort of emotional social literacy. I think, too, just to add on, at the elementary level, they've been doing standards-based for uh, two years, and then this is the first year the sixth grade has now moved from a grade to standards-based. And just looking at the impact, um, the teachers are more aware of all of the standards, the power standards, definitely. And also, what does it mean to be progressing towards uh, mastery of that standard, and what does it look like? So they have, I think, a better understanding of that child as they are approaching mastery or not approaching mastery, but also the kids. Because for, I know, one sixth grade class, 
when they received their papers back, they didn't have a percentage. It talked about the standard and where they were in that progress. And so they had a really rich conversation about what learning do you need to do in order to strengthen this particular standard. So it's so powerful for the teacher, but it's even more powerful for the learner because it's just not a 76, oh, I got that one wrong. It's this, this demonstrate my understanding of this particular standard. This is what I need to do to reach mastery. So, so it's a really powerful thing, and, and you, you've got to go about it somewhat slow for, for everybody, so it's, it's not a kind of a shock and awe, because in the end, I can say that the teachers are, are, are happy, and they, they collaborate with each other about, well, what does it mean to, to meet a standard in your writing rubric, and this is what it means to mine, so you're having a lot of calibration, too, so there have been a lot of pause. It wasn't an easy <laughs> journey. That, that is so encouraging to hear, and I'll shut up, because there is nothing worse than a grade on a paper without comments or any feedback on homework. It's, I'd rather not even have a grade, but you tell me where I hit it and where I missed it. Otherwise, nice it's worthless. Cards. Yeah. Be, the report cards have no comments in the elementary school. They're just numbers, and I have twins, and they're not consistent. The grading's not consistent? Three or the four is not consistent. I'm a, it's wonderful that you're saying this, but I wish my student was in that classroom. Am I? In that not. classroom. Okay. What you're describing, I don't see. We'll talk. Get, get, getting to consistency is, is the particular challenge uh, because it can only be done really if we can provide many opportunities for teachers to look at student work. No, of course. I'm just saying say, that. Why, this is why wonderful, is, but this is Ivory Tower. Like teachers have a hundred kids. What you're talking about is portfolio-based systems. I'm not talking about a portfolio. But, but, I wish I was, but I'm not talking about a portfolio. But what you're talking about is, is it has to have smaller classrooms and a lot of money to support it. You're going to have to have a whole cadre of, of special ed teachers, aides doing that. I don't understand where this is coming from because I'm sorry, but it, this is just, of course there's pushback from the teachers. They're like, how the hell are we going to do this? I mean, I, I'm sorry, but it just doesn't seem realistic to me. I mean, it sounds wonderful what you're talking about. I think about. it's about working smarter rather than working harder. I know, you know, I'm not saying that teachers have to work any harder, but I just say that, that uh, I mean, the parents want letter grades. That's how it is. I mean, I, I, and you're going to get a lot of pushback. If they want letter grades, they can have letter grades instead of numbers, but they would be the letters, representative numbers, of, doesn't matter, but of numbers. But the basic, the basic thing that you were addressing was What's, you've got two children and, and they seem to be getting different grades. But that's been consistent since, the, since day one. Ask the six, teach, six kids in, my, in eighth grade who have twins, the six parents who have twins, and consistently across the board you're like, oh, I got so-and-so this year. Of course, she, she starts at a two. This person starts at a oh. three. I mean, I, that's off topic. Well, that's because saying. probably all those teachers have got different grading policies. And my intention is we will finish up with one grading policy. That's almost impossible. Because what oh. you're saying, the, like the civics, all of that is subjective. Not, like, not if you have standards. Let me say, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it is about exercising professional judgment. But that professional judgment needs to be calibrated so that two teachers looking at the same piece of work come to broadly similar conclusions about its quality. That's fine. But but that's where we need to try to get to. I, I've lived for a long time with it. It's much easier to get into Mr. X class than Miss Y's class because he marks easily. And right, no, no, it doesn't matter. I mean, the teachers are doing a, a fine job. It's just, I just this, is, this is going to be very, very hard to do. I, I believe it is, but I think it's worth doing. If it's hard to do, it's probably important. All right. Um, the question was, is the, what is the pushback? We don't really know yet. I think that was kind of the answer. Um, is there anything else on the district development plan? I see the next thing on our agenda is review of assessments. So I don't know if there might, that might be a really good follow-up thing. Is there anything else on the district development plan before we move on to review of assessments? Review of assessments. Okay, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction and pass it on to the Chief Academic Officer. Um, during the course of last year, there was a kind of convergence of concerns amongst teachers and administrators around the sheer volume of assessments that were going on. And so we asked the question, um, what do we really need to do? Uh, do we have a, some assessments that, that are redundant, that are not providing us with 
uh, useful information? <coughs> and if so, can we, we weed out uh, some of the, the assessments that we're currently ad administering? So that was the question. And then the teaching and learning leadership team ran with that problem and Kim took responsibility for leading uh, the, f the follow-up work. So at the district level, we decided to uh, collectively review some of the district-wide assessments that we ask schools to uh, give students as far as benchmarking. And we were clear about identifying whether it was a formal, a formative assessment or a summative assessment so that we were using it in the right way for the right purposes. And so once we did that, we had a clearer view of how many assessments were given at what grade levels, what time of the year, and then how much time it actually took from instruction. And so once we took a step back, we broke up into smaller groups as far as um, literacy specialists, math specialists, to see if there were certain things that we could absolutely take off of our plate. And you can see in the reduction on the list, if you flip it, if you look at this chart, it's divided into 2014, 2015. And so it's also broken up to identify tests that are summative, some tests are formative, and some formatives can also be um, summative. So um, you will see that, let's see, on page 39, where it says 2014 district common assessments, local assessments um, three times a year. This year, um, we have decided to do only two assessments. And the last assessment, because we're doing the park and there is that end of the year assessment, that that will replace that. So that has reduced the amount of time. Um, it also tells you in this chart what the purpose of the test who is to uh, the population that will be taking the test, and then the audience. So that was one big in the area of the common assessments that we cut back. Let's see. As far as quarterlies, midterms, and final exams, um, they were teacher-created, and the purpose was to determine the level of understanding related to content covered during a set time, 9 through 12, and then 7 through 8 in ELA. And so the update as far as 2015 is that the quarterlies would be taken out at the high school level. And if they, are, were to, if they were to continue, they would be more formative and less um, formal than they have been in the past. So that should eliminate some of the testing there. At the middle school, when we spoke about, well, why do you give a midterm and a final? Their response was, because I thought we had to. So then just kind of um, having that discussion of, of where these originated, and because it, we always did that, was not a good enough answer for us. So, so some of them said, well, absolutely, I don't need it to be part of my grading system. It is additional testing. So as I won't go through every single page, but you can see in the end, um, at the elementary level, we reduce the time of just test taking down to 4.75 hours. At the middle school, it was reduced to two hours. At the high school, it was reduced to 10 hours. And so the total test assessment just time was reduced to 16.75 hours. And that only re is representative um, of the time spent on the assessment. That doesn't speak to if the teachers were using instructional time to prepare for the assessment or to review the assessment. So I do think the instructional time will increase um, because of this, this looking at the assessment and making sure what we do have in the district or at the school level is of quality and, and serves a purpose. Does anyone have any questions for Kim? Well, I, j I say bravo to this because I have firsthand experience just totally excessive testing. Kids that are looking at three and four tests on a day sometimes at that quarterly or that midterm Thank you for doing this work. And you said what it doesn't take into account was the prep time and all that. How about the studying time yeah. and the stress? So thank you for doing this whole review. Any other questions on the assessment review? Are you going to include DDMs in this? Do we include DDMs in this? DDMs are actually integrated into this. So this does not represent, like if a teacher has an end of a unit test, it doesn't incorporate that into it. But some of these assessments are DDMs, especially at the elementary level. Add in DDMs. Some districts are adding in assessments to use as DDMs. 
So we're that. using existing measures. Yes. That, that are already in place. Yes. Yep. Oh, yes. Any other questions on the review of assessments? Thank you, Kim. Next on the agenda is the appointment of the district representative to the board of the North Shore Education Consortium. If um, hopefully you had a chance to read the description of what that is. Um, Mr. Farmer, do you have any? At, at the moment, the, the whole of the membership of the board of the North Shore Education Consortium is made up of superintendents of, of schools. That's not to say, as this indicates, that um, a, a, a a committee member could could represent the district. Does the committee have any um, wishes one way or the other? <laughs> do, do we have a second on that? <laughs> any other nominees? All those in favor of Mr. Farmer being the representative? Thank you very much, Mr. Farmer. Unopposed. <coughs> Uh, the next item is the evaluation of the superintendents of schools, a timeline which we um, have looked at previously. So I would like to have a motion to approve the timeline as listed in your agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the timeline for the evaluation of superintendents of schools as listed. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you very much. Unanimous. Next, Mr. Farmer, the report of the superintendent of schools. Um, you, you have my report in front of you. Um, in terms of school visits, I've been into one or two more than is listed here. Um, I haven't been into the middle school because there was a, a stay in place this afternoon that got in the way of my, my visit. Um, I, I visited um, not the whole school, uh, but selected grades at Pine Grove, Salisbury. Um, and today I visited the, the math department in the high school. I've been a couple of times into Newbury on various pieces of uh, business. Um, I, I need to mention the NES playground development, uh, which is about a quarter of the way down. Uh, the, the PTA um, are, are developing a very ambitious plan to develop the, the playground at um, NES. Um, Brian and I and Chris Walsh met with the principal and three members of the PTA who are leading this um, er earlier in the week. Um, the, the, the PTA understand they need your approval of, of a change to the, the facility. And where we've got to is that prior to your meeting on November the 8th, they will consult with the teachers because the aim is in part that this should not just be a fun playground, but a, a place where learning can take place as, as well. Um, they will consult the, the school council, who are responsible for the general kind of ethos of the school. Um, and they will come to you before having any further conversation with uh, the town. Um, conversation with the town is necessary because they are talking about using part of what might now be described more of town field, town property, rather than the, uh, the, the, the school property itself. It's very ambitious. Um, they're, they're thinking they may be looking to raise $150,000, uh, uh, which is, is uh, big money. Um, that they have um, uh, contracted as uh, designers um, a company out of Ithaca, uh, New York called Play by Design, um, who um, uh, have produced some very interesting um, uh, playgrounds, particularly kind of climbing and, uh, and facilities, some of which I would describe as a little whimsical. Um, um, in, 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 in conversation, uh, we suggested that the committee would certainly want to think that whatever was being built was kind of sympathetic to the the Newbury kind of environment as a whole, um, rather than the kind of blot on the landscape. Um, we talked about uh, maintenance um, costs, and uh, they indicated they were looking to uh, develop a funding stream to maintain uh, the, the facility so there would be no additional 
uh, costs uh, to the, the district. Uh, we, we talked about the need maybe to phase it if, if it is such an ambitious project um, and that if it's phased, that phase one shouldn't put things in the way that would stop people getting to phase two when they need to, when they need to, uh, to, to develop it. Um, I, I thought it was a positive uh, uh, c c conversation. Uh, I, I believe that they are you know, determined that it will be a learning facility, not just a, a play space. Um, and um, I'm optimistic that they can do something uh, really useful that will benefit not just the school but the wider community in terms of access out of school. One of the concerns for the principal is that some of the ideas might well take children out of view of supervision. Uh, and what we don't want to do is to create a situation where children can get out of sight uh, of, of supervisors. Brian, you were at the meeting. Is there anything that you want to add, add, add to that? So this is really just to let you know that they're going to be hoping to come and talk to you at your <coughs> November meeting to present. And, and they're clear that their first pre presentation will look to get your, your kind of planning approval. They would still need to come back with their final design for your final approval. Uh, and we've indicated they shouldn't start raising money un until uh, they, they've got your, pl your, your planning approval. Okay? Um, pleased to say that my, my football kicker has a 100% record since I resumed coaching. I don't know whether I can have a new superintendent's evaluation goal to do with the success rate of the football kicker, but... Um, you, you can find nice. it at the state level. We'll be happy to include it. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, oh, okay. okay. Um, um, state testing. Um, we, we are we are looking to um, review um, whether we we have IEP accommodations that won't be accommodated by the, the park testing. What's slightly troubling is that some of the rubric around the park test suggests that. The park testing system will define what accommodations are acceptable to the test. And that might mean down the line that some accommodations that an IEP team meeting may think to be appropriate would not, would not be access, acceptable to the state testing uh, uh, ar arrangements. Uh, I've included the, the, the paper on, on grading practice really just, just for your uh, information. Um, on the 21st century grant, I did finally get a, a message from an attorney from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education on Tuesday of this week. They're going to try and get me that information when they can. I've mentioned the playground project. Stadium update is as is. Um, Brian and I met with um, a company that, that develop a slightly more, have developed a slightly more, much more sophisticated visitor management arrangement than we have at the, the present time that would include a photograph, the date, who, who they're supposed to be going to see, where, where they're supposed to be uh, going, which will better enable us to, to manage um, our visitors. I, I think that's all I need to draw attention to. Is there anything, Brian, that you have that I haven't included in here? I have a quick well, question. Maybe, maybe we ought just to say that we are, we, on the stadium, we are, we are in conversation with the towns about their capital Im approval systems. And as you, you picked that up. Um, so I've had uh, direct conversations with uh, Tracy Blaze in Newbury and Neil in Salisbury. I have not yet heard from uh, Debbie and Rowley. Um, I did just email earlier today. Was that yesterday? Yesterday. Yesterday. Um, but just to make sure that any of the processes that are in place in each town as far as capital planning, we are taking part in, in doing the same steps along the process that they would expect of any other um, member of the town um, or a department of the town. So um, in, in conversation with Neil, it is a much uh, more streamlined process. So I'll continue the dialogue with Neil. Uh, for Newbury, there is a, um, <coughs> a capital planning committee that will fill out, a, I mean, it's a very basic report. Um, and in the information we've provided that you've already seen probably gives more detail than, than many would even be looking for. So, um, and we'll likely have a discussion with them at a, at a committee meeting um, just so that it's above board. And I, I would hope that we would be able to do the same thing in Raleigh. 
our, our goal is that if we get to a town meeting and uh, a, citizen's ask, a citizen asks what's the recommendation of the capital program committee, that there's an answer, not that we haven't seen it. Thank you. Any questions on Mr. Farmer's report? Next, we have our subcommittee reports, finance subcommittee. Uh, with number, letter A, purchase of audiovisual equipment for the high school library. We'd like a motion to approve the purchase of two screens. Do we need to approve that? To approve the mo purchase of two screens, two projectors, and ancillary equipment to improve presentation facilities in the high school library at a cost of up to $15,000 as recommended by the finance subcommittee at its meeting on September 16, 2014. Cost to be met by the school choice revolving account. So moved. Could we have a second on that? I'll second. Is there any discussion? So I, I, I will just introduce the, you know, background to this, but um, besides all of our regular reports, these were the two um, issues that came up in our last meeting, and um, the funding for both, for this equipment, which is really, I'm going to hand this over to Christopher, because you are very passionate about this <laughs> as far as the capability of being able to do presentations in this room either for professional development for our meetings to host other things everybody has to turn there's that tiny screen and <laughs> there were several proposals we discussed all of them and we came down to what we think is the most cost cost efficient and effective way um, to make presentations in this space and um, we're looking to fund it through school choice revolving accounts. This isn't money left over from last year or taking from this year's budget. This is part of a revolving account where the money is there and Brian has assured me he's comfortable with this amount of money <laughs> coming out of revolving and not dropping it in any way that would. That was the last time he spoke to you. What was <laughs> I'm still comfortable with the total. The total went up a few hundred dollars. Okay, but at Talk least the... the <laughs> Your goal for this equipment. And well, you, you, well, you said it. I mean, th th y if you imagine all the high school faculty in here trying to look at a presentation on that small screen, I mean, <laughs> if, if we're going to do professional development, it needs to be good. It needs, needs to be quality. It needs to be smart. People are used to looking at high quality audiovisual stuff, and if they can't see the screen, they're going to switch off. I leave the room because my blood pressure goes up so much. At, at the, out of frustration that I can't, I can't physically stay in the room because I can go see people. I, I go, I go, I, I, I go, go and uh, kick Brian because they, th th this is not acceptable. Uh, we can't expect people to be attentive when we know that what we're putting in front of them. I think you're preaching to the choir. Neither, neither hear nor see. So, I mean, what engagement do you expect? We're good. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> Opposed? Thank you. Paul? Could we get a, a couple extra pesos and get the clock fixed while we're at it? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that clock is said 2 o'clock for, oh, I don't know, six, eight weeks now. <laughs> it's a different time zone over there, though. Yeah. We're good over there. Big library. Big, okay. Uh, could we have a motion to approve the purchase and installation of classroom projectors at Salisbury Elementary School at a cost of up to $20,000 in order to provide facilities comparable to those in the other elementary schools? As recommended by the Finance Subcommittee, it's meeting on September 16, 2014. Cost to be met by school choice revolving account. So moved. Would we have a second? A second. Any discussion? Would anyone like further background on this or is, is, are people prepared to vote? The issue is that, you know, we have inequity between the elementary schools and Salisbury doesn't have in their classrooms what the other two elementary schools have. So um, again, this would be funded through the revolving account of school choice so that all of our elementary school kids have the same access to that form of instruction and projectors. Linda? I think it's, I'm glad to see that's happening because I was concerned about that with the Chromebooks and the PTAs of the other towns supplying the, Salisbury doesn't have the PTA that the other schools have, so I approve it. And All those in favor? Aye. Post unanimous again. Thank you very much. Policy subcommittee. We need a motion to approve revisions to the policy on overnight and out-of-state visits to include provisions related to international visits as recommended by the policy subcommittee. It's meeting on September 30th, 2014. 
I'll make a motion to approve the revisions to the policy on overnight and out-of-state visits. I'll second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. A motion to approve revisions to the policy on tobacco-free schools to prohibit the use of e-cigarettes as recommended by the policy subcommittee at its meeting on September 13th, 2014. I'll make a motion to approve revisions to the policy on tobacco-free schools to prohibit the use of e-cigarettes. Thank you. Could we have a second? I'll second. Yeah. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Could we have a motion to approve a new policy that provides authority for school nurses to delegate responsibility for the administration of prescribed prescription medications to trained nursing supervised school personnel in accordance with state regulations as recommended by the policy subcommittee at its meeting on September 30th, 2014. So moved. Do we have a second? A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? And unanimous, thank you very much. Could we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Any discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> thank you very much. See you in November. We'll manage that.